Hello, I'm James B. Welcome to the James B. Podcast. This is my third podcast. I had Barbara Lika last week, David Clayton Thomas on my first show, and you can go back into YouTube vaults and find all those and watch them. And today my guest is none other than Gene DeNovi. He's 91, he's an incredible piano player, incredible storyteller, and what a memory. So I'm going to his house, uh, up into his attic, to interview him in just a moment. Uh, But first, as always, I'm gonna start with five to 10 minutes of listings, what's happening in the Toronto area. If you don't live in Toronto or you just wanna move on, skip ahead a few minutes and you'll get to the interview. But if you're looking for things to do in the next week or leading right up to New Year's, uh, you wanna stick around. Wanna thank barberfinancial.ca because they are a sponsor of this show. And if you'd like to sponsor the show, J-A-Y-M-Z-B-E-E-S-E-Z, at gmail.com and you can find out more. I also want to thank Barbarian Steakhouse, more than a restaurant, also a delicious steak seasoning. You can buy this in better stores everywhere and it works on tofu. It doesn't say don't use on tofu. It makes tofu taste even better. Okay, it's for sake. Uh, We're gonna move on to what's happening. I wanna start with Hughes Room Live. HughesRoomLive.com for listings. Uh, Tiki Collective is tonight. I think the show sold out. Call ahead. Uh, There was 20 tickets left yesterday and I'm pretty sure it's gone. Thanks to Now Magazine for the great story on the Tiki Collective uh, a couple days back. And uh, they also talked about Unison Benevolent Fund. I spoke about this last week. It's a great organization, unisonfund.ca, to find out about this very important charity. So uh, Hughes Room tonight, it's a benefit concert with the Tiki Collective, lots of special guests, probably sold out. But take a look at what's happening. This Friday coming, a week from tonight, Don Ross is performing. He's got phantom fingers on the guitar. You're gonna love it. Uh, then Susie Vinnick is gonna rock the house. Great blues singer, songwriter, and guitarist. Uh, then there's the Winter Garden Orchestra timeless treasures. They play beautiful old-timey music. And finally, New Year's Eve, it's Diane Braithwaite and Chris Whiteley making beautiful blues music uh, over at Hughes Room Live. Now, at Lula Lounge, uh, there is uh, violinist Aline Morales. Aline is really amazing. I've seen her many times, and she's playing with her band at 6.30, uh, and then a 12-piece Cuban group, and then DJ Suave. It might be suave, but I'm pretty sure it's suave. Uh, Anyway, lots of good stuff to check out always. And also, Pasta Supernova has a burlesque show coming up. So, lula.ca for all the listings. And if you're ever going to Lula, I really suggest you eat there as well. In fact, all of these places uh, have decent food. Something about jazz and food, it's a good thing because they they look after you. Uh, So, Lula Lounge is great. Hughes Room has really improved their menu. The Rex.ca, believe it or not, I go down there for a V Rex burger. It's a veggie burger and it tastes absolutely delicious. Uh, The Rex tomorrow, 3 30 on Saturday, Jerome Godbu is playing. He is a beautiful man. He is, his heart is so big. His charisma is only matched by his musicality. He's just one of those guys. Plays harmonica and sings. He's got some swagger. It's a really, really good time. Uh, So if you haven't seen Jerome Godbu, you can thank me later. And if you have, you're probably saying, duh, I'm already going. Move on. Okay, I'll move on. Sunday at 7 at the Rex Hotel, Whitney Ross Barra sings. I just saw her last week and she blew my mind. Uh, She can interpret any Thing. Okay, on paper, Hotel California swinging it with a little bit of bebop vocals it sounds like a bad idea on paper. Uh, you let Whitney take over, and it's suddenly a, a work of art. It's a masterpiece. So she can do anything, and uh, you should see her. Seven o'clock at the Rex. And following that, uh, jo- Jonathan Lindhorst, now he's a sax player from Berlin, he's going to be playing with Lena Alameno on trumpet, uh, Nico Dan on drums, and Dan Fortin uh, avec le contrabasse. So that's at uh, 9.30. Old Mill Toronto, what's coming up there? Oh, tonight, Amy McConnell and William Sparandi. Now, some people probably think they just had a fluke. Uh, their first record, Stealing Genius, was a hit on radio across the country. It was so well produced, so well received, critical acclaim, and I think it sold a bunch too. Well, if you thought it was a fluke, you're wrong, because the second album, uh, called Accomplice, was every bit as good as the first one. And you know that sophomoric album, that second difficult album? It usually 
doesn't work out so well for bands. The first record, you know, they have all their time to get ready and make this amazing record, and they've had years of practice, and then they have to follow up with a new record a year or two later, and it seems like a lot of pressure, but not for these guys. It's a great record, and if you get Accomplice, you need to go to the track I Wish You Love. It's a, a crazy work of art. So you need both those records. You can find them online, pick them up, and if you're free tonight, go down to Old Mill Homesmith Bar and see Amy and William. I should tell you, New Year's Eve, Old Mill Toronto has two things going on. Alex Pangman is in the Homesmith Bar. Tickets are 165 per person, but this is exclusive. I, I can't imagine there's more than 60 people in this room. And you're getting food with that. You're getting a meal. You're getting desserts. You're getting a champagne toast. And you're seeing Alex Pangman and her alley cats in a tiny room. Now, also at Old Mill is something New Year's Eve, two parties. One is in the main ballroom. It's $180 a ticket. It includes uh, food. It includes dancing to a DJ. And it's a huge ballroom. Now, this may feel like a wedding reception or it may feel like a hip nightclub party. Not sure what to expect, but it's a timeless treasure. It's like partying in Hogwarts. I love the building. Uh, they do have hotel rooms, but you'll want to book them right away uh, if you're going to be going to the Old Mill for anything. Now, there's also a main dining room, and then there's, of course, the Homesmith Bar. The Homesmith Bar is Alex Pangman, $165 uh, for a ticket. Again, food, dessert, champagne, and you're hanging out with Alex Pangman and her alley cats in a cozy little venue. I'm assuming there's only probably 60 tickets available for that beautiful little room, the Homesmith Bar. So, oldmilltoronto.com for all that information. Uh, Jazz Bistro, Molly Johnson is there New Year's Eve. Now, I'll give full New Year's Eve listings again next Friday. Friday, the thing is, I want to tell you now because these things are going to sell out. Uh, another one, and this is one I'm involved with, is the New Year's Eve party at La Revolution, or La Rev, and that's in the junction. It's kind of just north of Hughes' room. Um, oops. That was a reminder to tell you about the party New Year's Eve at La Revolution. Okay, whatever. Uh, bell went off. Um, we're going to be doing a great party there. Uh, Adam James is in from LA. He is a lovable funster. This guy is got a lot of swagger, a lot of talent. Uh, if you like Sinatra uh, with Edge, uh, that would be this guy. He's so much fun. He's really one of my best friends. So he's coming up from LA and he's going to be the star of the show. Uh, his alter ego, Gary Underpants, uh, will be DJing in the back room after the big show. So you're going to be able to sit down, dine on Mexican food that is not expensive, uh, beautiful cocktails, some of them tequila based, um, and also bubbly and everything else. So you got a glass of bubbly when you walk in because why wait till midnight? Really? Uh, then you also get entrance, a guaranteed seat, live entertainment. It's a $50 ticket. There's only 40 tickets left. And the band are amazing. Allison Young on saxophone. She is a rising star. Everybody wants to play with her. Everyone's booking her. Uh, she's been famous for a few years now, but she's just, she's catapulting right now. And uh, George Kohler. Everybody loves George. He's going to be playing electric bass for the most part. Uh, Robert Scott and Great Bob Scott, a dynamic duo who are not related. Uh, Robert Scott, of course, wrote the song Hollywood for Michael Bublé and is an incredible piano player. And Great Bob Scott, one of the most entertaining drummers and gifted drummers in Canada. So this is going to be an amazing show. Heather Lockhart will be joining me. We're kind of going to kind of co-host and do double duty and run around both rooms having fun. And a whole bunch of other special guests. So if you want those be mused there's the link above me be mused and you really want to get those tickets right away uh, oh last thing is drum taberna drum taberna I, I don't know how to say that name of that club and I also I'm not sure if I'm gonna get the basis right Dweeney Booth Dweeney Booth uh, has played with Chuck Mangione Freddie Hubbard Elvin Jones Shelley Mann uh, he was a messenger with the Jazz Messengers, a Trey Knight with McCoy Tyner, a Monkite with Thelonious Monk, a Sun Ra Satellite, Sun Ra, oh man, um, from 1989 and then went back again in 96 to play some more. So he's been in the Sun Ra Orchestra. I love this dude. And he's going to be playing uh, acoustic bass uh, with Lucien Grand Guitar, Mark Hundevand on uh, drums, and it's happening at Drum da Berna. Now this is... Um, uh, two blocks east of the Cameron House, just a little bit, uh, or west, just a little bit west of Spadina on the north side. Cool little club. They've been doing good things there lately. December 28th from 7 to 10, you can see this bass player. Uh, December 30th, 4 until 6. 
And he's also playing at the Pilot Tavern on December 29th. Uh, I'm hope to get an interview with him when he's in town uh, to play later because he has got to have some stories. And speaking of stories, oh my, we're going to get to our featured interview in just a second. Uh, I should tell you a little bit about this man. Uh, he is legendary among songwriters. He has composed so many famous songs. My favorite would be, or favorite stories are him and Johnny Mandel. And, uh, sorry, Johnny Mercer. He worked with Johnny Mandel as well. Johnny Mercer, they wrote some great tunes together. Uh, he met Duke Ellington. He worked with Peggy Lee. We're going to get as many stories as we can from this 91-year-old genius. Uh, and uh, once again, I have a Patreon page. If you want to help support this show, uh, you can donate any amount. Five bucks a week goes a long way. I've month five bucks a month goes a long way and i really appreciate everybody who helps out here uh, so we're going to go over now to gene denovi and let me tell you i am excited james here you are hey how are you this is up north for you isn't it <laughs> that's right north of bluer right so let's go going north this way well no actually we're going south but <laughs> <laughs> well we're going up the stairs up the stairs this house is uh Three floors, and if I'm fit at all, it's because of these stairs. So there you go. <laughs> so this is where the music has happened here since I've come to Canada, right? In this room. Wow. <laughs> That's a good welcome. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to just sit right in here. All right, so my first question, let me just make sure I got all of you in there. Perfect. Your early days, you were born in New York? Born in Brooklyn, actually, at the Brooklyn Hospital, 1928. Makes me 9-0. I'm sitting here at 9-0. Can you imagine? So you're 90 years old. You know, your yeah. piano is in the attic of a very tall, thin house with a lot of stairs. <laughs> is that your workout regimen, is I, walking to your piano? I guess so. I have no choice. If I want. <laughs> so how did you get your piano up into your attic? Very carefully. <laughs> Had to come around the corner, you know, and all of that, you know, so. So you really, this was actually not through a window. You This was brought upstairs? Well, what they do is they take the legs off, you see. Yeah? Yeah. They, they, they. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And you have been here how long in this home? In, well, in this home, it's about 20 years now. Before that, we lived at Arcadia on the lake shore. You know, the place down there, which yeah. is for artists and so forth. And that was wonderful, but then my son had to go to school up here. William, who's doing very well now in hot docks, he's very hot in that thing. He's, he's hot in hot docks, you know, so <laughs> he's doing very well. Now, you started, I, I mean, I heard a rumor that the person who first discovered you and brought you into the fold was Dizzy Gillespie. Oh, yeah. Oh, Tell yeah. me about meeting Dizzy Gillespie or him meeting you. Well, the thing was, uh, it was wartime in New York City, and believe it or not, they had a curfew uh, in uh, that went on in the after actually the groups worked believe it or not for about four in the afternoon to midnight and then they had a curfew or a, a blackout and uh, of course America in those days wasn't attacked from overseas so this went on for a couple of years but I was 15 and a half how they let me in I don't know I was 15 and a half years old you know and uh, but Dizzy had heard me. I used to live on, that was my, my education was on 52nd Street. Because you came to 6th Avenue and 52nd Street, and you had the Three Deuces and the Spotlight Club and Leon and Eddie's and the 21 and all of these places. And that's where I would go in the summertime. You could stand at each door. You could hear Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie in one, uh, Billy Holiday in another. You know, just put your ear in the door in the summertime, and it was an education. <laughs> and that was my college, you know. <laughs> but Dizzy had heard me. I think he heard me in the afternoon once at uh, uh, in the Deuces, 
you know. And of course, the youngsters of my age were trying to play bebop like he and Charlie Parker were doing. So he had an ear out for the guys who were the disciples, so to speak, you know. And, uh, but they had this thing from 4 in the afternoon to 12 at night. I remember a guy named Monty Kay collected the two bucks that you could sit down and, you know, get a ginger ale or something and hear the greatest musicians in the world, you know. So I used to go in there and I'd sit there and just, just listen. But this day, the guys are all getting on the stand. Buck Clayton, Harry Edison, Max Roach, later Shelley Mann, all of the all these people were getting on the bandstand, but a guy named Matt Jack Jaffe was supposed to play piano, and he wasn't there. And uh, uh, Dizzy said, "Come on up here and play." I said, "What?" You know, <laughs> that's the opening line in the book that Jack Batten used in the book. He said, uh, "What does Dizzy Gillespie want with a 15-year-old kid?" You know. Anyway, I sat down and I played. Love had come back to me faster than it has had ever been played. I was thrown into the sea of Now, did new they count music. it in fast, or were you excited and started it fast? Well, I was too dumb to be. Uh, no, he, he caught He One, two, one, two, three, he called it off. See? <laughs> right. He, he beat it off for me. Yeah. But what was it? Man, two, I'm going to do, 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 do. About that tempo, you know. It was that fast. You know? So I ended up playing like this for about 15 years. <laughs> now, did you get to ch play with Charlie Parker? Well, what happened was in the middle of all the things you are, I remember, was the tune. Get to the end of the chorus, and this guy comes around the corner. Chabiba, chabiba, everybody went, what the hell is that? First time I heard Charlie Parker, I was playing with him. Whoa! That's the opener. <laughs> oh, that's a big opener. I have a list of people you have played with, and I'd love a story. Uh, Benny Goodman, did you? Did he ever shoot you the ray, that gaze he had? Oh, yeah, I would look at his ear, though. I'd just look at his ear until he stopped. Because <laughs> he was famous for staring down musicians oh, yeah. all the time. Oh, yeah. No, no, I, I just sit at his ear, and I'd play double time runs while looking at his ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he could be a great guy, and he could also be pretty thoughtless, you know. All right, so uh, let's talk Buddy Rich. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Another guy who was, I mean, and I swear he was manic depressive. No question about it, you know. And also the greatest drummer that ever lived. Uh, I didn't appreciate it. I was eighteen, nineteen years old, you know. <clears throat> But, you know, I was trying to play bebop, and he, oh, he made me cry. I was with his band when I was 18, 19, you know. He's screaming at me. Yeah, you're playing too much. Rah, 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 rah. Play more like Basie. Rah, 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 that kind of thing, you know. I remember then he pulled me into his dressing room. He says, look, I'm a pretty sensitive guy, too. And I thought to myself, you sure have a funny way of showing it, you know. <laughs> but anyway... Yeah, you come from a bebop school, and you're now asked to play like Basie yeah. in a Buddy Rich band that's very loud and busy. Yes, right, yeah, right, right. And he he just uh, he says that, you know I, I'm also a very uh, you know sentimental, uh, uh, lovable guy. He was trying to approve, and he sure didn't treat me that way, you know. <laughs> but you know what? Twenty five, thirty years later, I got him to cry because I was watching. I was up in. Uh, Cal Neva in Vegas, you know, I was there with Mitzi Gain actually in the in the big room, and but on the stand was Harry James and and Billy Eckstein and Buddy Rich was playing in the Harry James band. And uh, what year would this have been around? This would have been in the sixties. Sixties, yeah. It was the end of the forties when I played with him, you know. So anyway, he came off the stand, and of course, you know, he he just played so incredibly, impossibly great, you know. I said, buddy, you're the greatest drummer that ever lived, there's no question. And you know what? I got a tear out of him. And I said, took me 30 years, but I got back at you, you son of a gun, you know. <laughs> Artie Shaw. Oh, yeah? Now, we talked about Benny Goodman having on and off days. Was Artie Shaw also a little bit of a uh, heavy band leader? 
I know Arnie Shaw was wonderful. He was, he was different from Be Benny. Wanted to find out about bebop, but he wouldn't admit it. So, so he he had mentored a guy named Stan Hasselgaard, a Swedish clarinet player, who played more more like Buddy DeFranco than Benny Goodman, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he wouldn't admit he wanted to know about me, but he wanted to find out what these young smart kids were doing, you know. Uh, or he or that's putting it a nice way, you know. Mm -hmm. But Shaw just had the intellectual uh, curiosity. He wanted to know what he says. Well, what do you guys do? What do you do? what do you do with a tune? And naturally, when you're twenty or twenty-one years old, you know everything. So I threw my coat on the thing, took it off, threw it down, and said, "Oh, well, we do this and we do that. We do the other thing. We flat this fifth and blah blah blah." The only thing you can do with that much confidence when you're 18 and 19 years old, you know what I mean? But he was just great about it. And he said, oh man, that's great. Oh, well, that's nice to do that, you know? I said, if you go to the Sonic, you don't have to go. You can go. You know, all these kind of things. And he thought, and he thought it was wonderful because he had the intelligence to immediately understand what was going on. So he just wanted to know about this new music. So he hired this 18, 20, I, was, I guess I was 20 or 21 by then. Mm -hmm. I was getting older at that point. <laughs> he lived at the Beaux-Arts apartment in New York City. I remember this. And the reason I got to know him was because I was standing in a doorway next to Charlie's Tavern where all the musicians hung out. And... Uh, a guy named Lou Brown, who played for uh, Jerry Lewis for years, he was walking along, and I was standing out of the rain in a in a it was a dry cleaning place, and it was the doorway. And Lou Brown said to the guy walking with us, "There's your man, there's Gene Denovi. Why don't you hire him?" <laughs> <laughs> wow. and the guy said, "Would you like to be? Would you be at? Uh, would you be at?" Um, Artie Shaw's apartment tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I said, okay, fine. And that's, I just described what happened there, but wow. that's how it happened. <laughs> wow. And how about Lester Young? Well, well, he, he wasn't thrilled with us, really. He, we adored him, of course. But uh, Len, uh, Leonard Feather, I owe that to Leonard Feather, because he, al along, me, along with uh, Chuck Wayne and Tiny Khan and Clyde Lombardi, and all of these younger guys who were playing bebop, uh, Leonard would foster us because he, he liked us and playing the new music. And uh, Lester Young, oddly enough, used to have not such a great rhythm section sometime. And Leonard Feather said, I want to get you guys to make a record with Lester Young. We said, wow, you know. I can never forget Tiny Khan, who was a great drummer and arranger. And funny, funny man. He's a great, funny guy. Wonderful drummer. Was Tiny Tiny or tiny. a big guy? Oh, he was like 300. I don't know, 240. He was a That's natural. a jazz thing. They always have oh, yeah. the nickname of the opposite. That's <laughs> right. right. But he was a beautiful guy. And uh, he was also a terrific arranger. And we had a big band with Chubby Jackson, which was a wild band, you know, of all the, all the new young beboppers, you know. But anyhow... Uh, so, so this this was the era of those kind of things happening. It was unbelievable. And you said Lester was, was, but Lester Lester worked with these guys, and uh, he he was not crazy about with these new guys. Curly Russell was on bass for the thing, and uh, he came in, and I remember at one point he said. Lester said, "Well, why don't you do blah 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 and do this and do two bars of this and you do two blah blah blah." blah you know, making a sort of a format for the tune. And uh, and Lester, in his usual own language, said, uh, well, if Prez's kiddies were here, they would know what to play behind Prez. Oh, wow, you know. <laughs> so that shot us in the heart, so to speak, you know. But you know what? We got playing, and Tiny started to swing him. And Tiny made him play. In the end, it ended up that he thought these kids were okay, but you know, 
But it, it was not love at first sight. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> About fifth sight. <laughs> now, so many of these singers are household words. You actually toured with Peggy Lee. The first singer I ever played with. Peggy Lee. First. Wow. Yeah. And was this 60s? Uh, no, no, no. It was earlier than that. It was just the beginning of the 50s. But I used to hang around with the... Uh, Rhythm section from the Claude Thornhill band was Billy Exener on drums, Joe Shulman, a bass player, Barry Galbraith, a guitar player, and Gil Evans was the piano player because he was the arranger for the band. And I used to go to Nola Studios and sit in with them. And Gil liked my playing. He really liked my playing. And wow, whoa, you know, so. Uh, but then. Peggy, by that time, had divorced Dave Barber, who she was married to, and had gotten down to just a drummer and a piano player to accompany her on the road. So she <laughs> she put an ad in Downbeat saying, uh, you know, a rhythm section. And so the guys in the, in the Thornhill band answered the ad and said, we'd love to come with you. So she took the... Claude Thornhill rhythm section wasn't working at that time, moved it there, and they needed me as piano player because Gil was really an arranger. He didn't play that fantastic piano. He wrote fantastic arrangements, of course. So that's the milieu I got into in the middle. So of Peggy Lee guys. took out an ad in Downbeat. That yeah. is an amazing thing. And hired this rhythm section. Wow. Oh, but at that point, Dave Barber was still married to her, who was a guitar player. So he fronted the band, but that was the band that I just mentioned. Right. And they did Black Coffee together, right? Oh, no, that would be later. Oh, that's way oh, later. Oh, that was getting later. You okay. know, this was uh, Don't Smoke in Bedtime. Remember that tune of mm -hmm. us? Yeah. It's way back then in Manana and uh, all of those tunes, you know. Yeah. And what about Tony Bennett? Tony, well, uh, we, we were... Actually, he's two years older than I. He's still going, man. He's still going at night. And you're both he's Italian. Still, you know, and still eating the same pasta every day. <laughs> that, and and neither of you are heavy drinkers. No, no, I never did. I never, I never understood it. Never understood smoking or drinking. Couldn't fathom it. Why would you want to put all that smoke into your body? You know, I just, just. I got enough of a second hand, mind you, on 52nd Street. There was no filtering in those clubs. You know? and, and kids these days don't even know, remember these times, of course, right, but yeah. there was smoking allowed everywhere, in record company offices, oh, yeah. elevators, oh, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Airplanes, everywhere. Unbelievable, yeah. And especially jazz clubs, the smoky jazz club. Yeah, they, that, uh, that was a requisite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you play with Tony very much? Did you oh, guys yeah, well, about a year and a half. In 1950, but uh, we had known each other, and one of the things I like about Tony is he was always very, very uh, conscious to be respectful of musicians. He was always good that way, and had great admiration for Basie and Ellington, which was different than a lot of singers, you know? You just mentioned Duke Ellington. I heard a story about Duke Ellington that somehow he fell into your arms. Oh, is that yeah. a true story? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, I was playing for Lena Horn by then, which was really uh, beyond college education musically, because Lenny Hayton, she was married to Lenny Hayton in those days, who I learned 50% of what I know from. He was at MGM for like 13 years. But we were doing a show with Lena called Jamaica on Broadway, and Ellington came to see her. So he came down and shook hands with all of us. but. Uh, uh, after the show, he came around backstage and went upstairs to see Adelaide Hall, who sang the original Creole love song with his band in, I don't know, 1920-something. But he went up to see Adelaide Hall, see? And I'm coming upstairs to go into Lena and Lenny's dressing room, and Duke is coming down the stairs, this iron staircase, you know? And he gets about the third step, and I'm coming around in front of him, and he falls over toward me. He trips on the stairs. And I got Duke Ellington in my arms. <laughs> and he's three times your size. <laughs> well, he, and, but he had been in the middle of a, of a dieting spree or something. Mm -hmm. So I held him in my arms, 
And the only thing I could think to say was, Father. He got 20. He got, he actually went silent, which is good. The silent to Duke Ellington. And he looked at me, and I don't know what he was thinking. My God, not another one. Either that or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here comes a super fan. <laughs> <laughs> but... I was such, you know, he was one of my great musical teachers from afar, you know. Mm -hmm. So there I am with him in my arms, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he came in, and he, he was still sure shaken from it, because you figured, you know, because he, it said more than anything. Any one, what accolades could I say after that? I was saying this is where part of my life came from, you know. That's right. I I always say Duke Ellington is the uh, boardwalk of Jazzopoly. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, in later years, he wanted after Strayhorn died, he wanted me to go with the band. But I, I was at on the Joy Bishop show, and uh, my kids were little, and all of this, and probably would have wrecked my marriage. Because if you went with him for two weeks, you'd end up four years being there. Right. That's he never stopped worked. touring, he and he never stopped go. recording. And right. I, and I would have, of course, been enamored by it, but. Uh, I didn't do it. I didn't do it at the time. So it's Tell me about the Joey Bishop show. I actually remember that show. Oh, it was yeah. an interesting show. We had a great band, which you never heard, because Joey wasn't very musical, you know. But Willie Schwartz, a great lead alto player for, ben, for uh, uh, Clem Miller. Uh, 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 Frank Beach, uh, Tommy Shepard, all of these great... You know, and, of course, Ray Brown on bass. Louis mm. Belson, uh, Herb Ellis, wow, and me. That was the rhythm wow. section. Yeah, yeah. Now so, this was a Broadway show or the television show? It was the television show. Right. And the reason I didn't go with Duke because I was wanting to be a songwriter in those days, and literally every day I could meet another singer who might do one of my tunes. It was, it was perfect. Right. When all kinds of people came on that show who uh, uh, did my tunes and stuff, you know, so it was an ideal place to be at the time, really. You know? Now you're mentioning songwriters. Uh, I'm going to ask if you if you've written with or met people like Harold Arlen. Oh God, yeah, I got to hang with him in Jamaica. I got to hang out with him. I used to go to his apartment on Central Park West. Amazing. I play my tunes for him. <laughs> wow! And Johnny Van Heusen. Jimmy, Jimmy. Oh, sorry, Jimmy, Jimmy Van Heusen. Yeah, well, he was always around Lena, so I see through Lena Horn, I got to meet a lot of people. This is what some of the things I say in concert are like, you know, you're looking at a guy who sat between Edith Piaf and Lena Horn. Lena Horn. You sat, and I say, this is a guy who sat before uh, uh, Lena Horn and... Uh, who sang Move River in the picture? Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. Wow, you met Audrey Hepburn? I sat beside her. Oh. Yeah. And so, and it was a dressing room feeling, you know. You know, Can you imagine? I didn't realize what was going on. And, you know, I, I'm sitting in the middle of history. Right. This is an interesting thing is while all this is happening to you, you're just living your life. You don't, you, in some cases, you know that you're in greatness with Duke Ellington, but maybe you you couldn't know when you're that young how lucky you are to be working with all these different people and how this would oh, yeah. historically end just up. Just about everybody in the 20th century, you know, Yeah. because one thing led to another. I ended up being Gene Kelly's musical director for six specials. I worked with Kelly. I missed the stare, but I worked with Kelly on six of them. Wow. And, and we got along like gangbusters. We got along so well. Now, uh, Johnny Mandel. Oh, well, yeah. Well, we, he's, he's two years older than me, too. Yeah. And Johnny Mercer. Now, you wrote a song with Johnny Mercer, and you're the only person I've ever met who wrote a song with Johnny Mercer. Well, I wrote two, and the second one was a scandal. <clears throat> the, the, good, the, the first one was Have a Heart, which many people did. <clears throat> of course, I owe all of this to the to Lou Edelman and his family. Who is Lou Edelman? Lou Edelman was a producer. The other day, I just saw a thing. Uh, he, he did White Heat. He was Barbara Stanwyck's producer all his life. But he had a daughter named Rosemary, who was a singer, and who I played for one night in New York City, and she never forgot it, because I sort of saved the day, came in and played for her. 
She says, when you get to L.A., you call me. I want you to meet my father. And I met, I walked into a room in Beverly Hills, and I walk in, and there's Johnny Mercer, Rube Bloom, uh, uh, Harry Ruby, who later sponsored me into ASCAP. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, American Society of Composers, Authors, right. Publishers. He, yeah. he, he, in, into that. So there, I'm sitting there, and so Rosemary so says, just play something on the piano. And I go to the piano, and there's something there that says, from Mrs. Jerome Kern. Like Jerome Kern used to play that piano when he'd come to Beverly Hills in L.A. at Lou's house. And Lou loves songwriters, you see. So there I am, I'm playing for these guys. I don't know what they wrote in those days, but I could find out. Because once I'd play a tune, and if it was Harry Warren, he'd say, thanks for playing my song, kid, you know, from the other side of the room. <laughs> so that's how I got into this fascination with songs, you know. Wow. And when did you go from New York to L.A.? Well, it was a back and forth business. It was a who who I was working with at the time. So I generally, right, back, anytime. Vegas was the main, main, main place to be working because from New York or L.A., where the big stars were all doing shows in those days. I'd work with Dinah Shore. I worked with Mitzi Gaynor. I'd work with Lainey Kazan. Whoever was going to Vegas would just take me along from one one ha city or the other. That's right. So the, that was the, the main source, and uh, you mentioned another song I with Johnny Mercer, a second song. Yeah, and I made the mistake of giving him the title, which is usually not a good thing to do. I had written a tune called "Cheat on Me." One of these kind of bluesy things, mm -hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And she says, oh, I like that. I said, okay, well. So he wrote it, and he wrote the most magnificent, violent lyric, and he wrote three choruses of it. Cheat on me, and I will skin your hide, have your teeth arrow-fied. I'll show you how rough a shook-up mama can be. <laughs> Cheat on me, and I will wheel my mace, change the shape of your face, slightly redesign your physiognomy. If you want to cool it and golden rule it, I'll react the same. Smoke right prefer the right way, the night's a polite way. Tiger will be tame. Cheat on me and I will... I will uh, cheat on me and I will call up... I will drop a bomb. Even worse, even worse, call up mom. You'll become the range that I scoot cheat... I, that I shoot skeet upon if you ever try to cheat on me. Amazing I, lyrics, I, well, but I, a little bit much for back then, right? I have to go back to Lena Horn with it, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> she she did. She said, "I can't sing that," you know. And then I went this back then, and he 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 flipped. He walked up and down the living room for twenty minutes, and then he said something interesting. He said, "Okay, let's write another one." <laughs> but he did this whole dialogue on singers, how how mean they were, and, and why, how much they owe to writers, and so forth and so on. You know. Well, he really was one of the greatest lyricists ever, right? Oh, no question. Yeah. No question. Wow. But if he got drunk, all the women got flowers. They always got, got flowers in the morning. So Joe Stafford just said, oh, I don't want flowers in the morning, Johnny. Because when we introduced Have a Heart at, in... Uh, with Lena, all of Hollywood was there, but he got drunk and insulted everybody. And wow. Yeah. But Have a Heart was covered by so many people, right? Mostly musicians and mostly piano players. Yeah. Victor Feldman, Dick Hyman, Mike Renzi, mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Scott did it on guitar. Yep. Who I have that version. Who's been listening to me since he was, he doesn't like it when I say, since he was uh, in a carriage, you know, <laughs> in, a, in a crib. You have a few people like that, Andrew Scott, Ernesto Cervini, oh, young yeah. people who really look up to you that you have mentored. Yeah, they've been listening to me till they're in cribs. <laughs> <laughs>
exactly. <laughs> so tell me about the move to Canada. You ended up as the house pianist for CBC in the late sixties, early seventies. No, what that I was the uh, uh, well, I was at a party and a wonderful lady named Ann Gibson was there, and we got talking, and for some reason we got into George, talking about George Gershwin, who was born in Brooklyn, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. among other things. And uh, she said, why don't you come on and do on the radio what you just did here? And I didn't sing at all in those days, but it forced me to sing and made a performer out of me. Between Ann Gibson and John, what was his name, uh, Bob Gibbons, they made performers out of me. So I went from being a, an accompanying musician to being a performer th from in the CBC because I would do five shows on Cole Porter, five shows on Harold Arlen. So I found an old list in the country recently where I keep a lot of these tapes. There's them there must have been a, a hundred of those shows that I did. Wow. On CBC. Oh, I hope they still they're, have some archives. Well, they're all on, on tape there. They probably put pet... Oh, well, I also did run on TV Ontario called The Music Room, where I interviewed 13 writers for the movies. Harry Warren, uh, Rue Bloom, uh, 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 Sammy Fain, Sammy Kahn, uh, Bronislaw Caper, Maddie Malnack, Thirteen of them. Wow. And I have a feeling they put a pet show over that one, too. <laughs> oh, I hope not. I hope they kept the tapes. <laughs> um, you were in Japan for a while in the 80s. You toured Japan. Who are you touring with? Uh, me and either Dave Young or Neil Swainson, primarily. Beautiful. So, yeah, yeah. you had a long affinity with, with those two bass players here in well, Canada. Well, uh, Jim Campbell and I, who I owe a lot to as well, been through the Festival of the Sound. Because he's, he's given me that venue to work on now for, what, 35, 40 years, you know. He couldn't go, so he sent me. So I ended up with about seven, eight trips to Japan, either with Neil or David or, and whoever. Uh, you know, uh, so I would, I would... But I owe that to a guy named Mark Gardner in, in England, who wrote for the Jazz Journal and still does, as a matter of fact. One of the few people I sent a Christmas card to every year. Uh, but he told Jofu about me, Mitsuo Jofu. And Jofu loved to record old bee poppers, you know. So when I went for the Ontario government in 1990, he said, stay here and come and record for me in Yokohama. And that, that's how that started. Wow. So a lot of trips to Japan. And now in the last... 20 or more years, uh, you've still been doing seminars, classes, uh, uh, concerts where you tell stories and sing and play. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I can't, I don't, uh, you can't take, the stories are so important to a lot of the songs, you know. Mm hmm You know, when you think of, I'll be seeing you was in a, laid in a drawer for about 15 or 20 years, they didn't pay any attention to it. It almost didn't. So it makes you wonder about what we haven't heard. You know? oh, wow, I didn't know Although that. The Rainbow had a tough time getting in the movie, you know. That's right, but I'll be seeing you. I didn't know that that was something that sat Can around. you imagine? No, it's one of the most beautiful you ballads. Peggy. Peggy does an incredible job on that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, there were so many songs that almost didn't. Yeah, like The Bad and the Beautiful, you know, this magnificent... <laughs> That thing, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, from the movie, he also wrote Laura, David Raxon. That almost didn't get in the movies. You know, when you think about, there might have to be other ones that didn't get in there, you know. Right, if that one, if Laura almost didn't get in the movie, yeah. then what else right. didn't exactly. get in the movie? Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Now, you did a two-day interview. This is like, you know, a half-hour interview. You did a two-day interview with the Smithsonian. Oh, yeah, yeah. They came by when I lived at Arcadia. They came there. It, that was particularly nice for me because I have a memory of my son, which is quite wonderful. Because I don't know what William was at that time. He's about ten, but he watched these two guys and he knew they were writers. And I think that's what made him a writer. He loved the watching the interview for his father. Right. Wow. Now, your memory is unbelievable. You must have told me. I don't even know, 40, 50 names just now. You remember not just 
the celebrities, but the side musician, the people who introduced you to people, oh, yeah. how, how is it possible? I mean, it's not even that you're 90, even if you were 50, I would ask you this. How is well, it possible you have such a fantastic well, like, memory? Uh, like Joe Fu, I, I always had a penchant, people pointed this out to me, of people who, who are not big names but were great, like Hugo Friedhofer, who won the Academy Award for uh, Best Years of Our Lives. The average person doesn't know who Hugo Friedhofer is. This is a guy that we all learn from. He was the dean of Hollywood composers. Just ask John Williams, Andre Previn, all the other great ones, mm -hmm. and they will tell you that Hugo, he was the big fa the father or the brother to all of us. Or Tony Frisella, the trumpet player. He was like the Chet, Chet what's his name, in California, you know, Chet. Chet Baker. Chet Baker. He was the Chet Baker of New York. Right. An Italian kid who uh, was an orphan, came out of an orphanage, got a silver horn, had perfect ears, and just played with Charlie Parker because Charlie Parker would say, I want you to learn this, and he'd, he'd, Charlie Parker would play it, he'd learn it in one take. Right. He never became Savant, yeah. terribly, he never became great, really popular. Chet did. Mm -hmm. but not Tony. Right. So I always had a penchant for these kind of guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I figured, well, everybody's heard of Henry Mancini. Let's talk about the guy who you don't know. But you maybe know. it's because you weren't into drugs and you weren't into alcohol or smoking even cigarettes oh, that, that your brain is so large oh, yeah. because you really do have amazing well, memory. You know, the old story, the old story is that the guys love to say, well, well, I didn't know I'd become 90. If I knew I was going to get this old, I would have taken good care of myself. Well, the fact of the matter is I have taken good care of myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about eating habits? Well, this, to, to, to the women in my life have been very good to me. That My, my wife, Deirdre, is, makes this incredibly delicious food that's very healthy, you know, for me. And she's unbelievable because she runs a big casting business and she makes an incredible six meals a week for me. I don't know how she does it, but she's marvelous. So that's part of it. And the stairs, of course. <laughs> yeah, and three flights of stairs to play yeah, the piano every day. usually in the wintertime, I do about 10 minutes on the treadmill. But uh, all, of, all of these, I mean, you, you sit at the piano, I mean, doing these. <laughs> You know, doing these kind of tunes, you know, uh, you know, uh, get in the, you get, well, you, you, there's a lot of exercise in that, I think. I do think so. Yeah. Right oh. Yeah. Now, do you have any advice for young people getting into the business and maybe more about the passion and music side than the business side? It's funny you mention passion because Every once in a while I think about Michel Donato in, in Montreal, he's a wonderful bass player and a funny, great guy. He's just, he's just a wonderful guy. And he's, uh, huh. he gave me the nicest compliment. He says, you still have the passion. Yep. That's what it's about. Incidentally, I cry at supermarket openings, so watch it. <laughs> no, but he is really special, right? Just, what what a beautiful thing to say. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. It's right up with the top ones. The other one was Mercer. I was, when I was writing with Johnny, you know, mm -hmm. Mercer. He did in Bellagio Road in, in, in uh, I guess it's West L.A., really. So we drove up there and drove to his place, and his, his place overlooks like a gigantic golf course or something. And we were working away, and he turned around and he said, he says, you know what? I said, what? He says, you remind me of Vernon Duke. Whoa! <laughs> You're talking about April in Paris, autumn in New York, all right? Mm -hmm. Taking a chance on love. I like the likes of you. Okay. A yeah. lot of hits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and who was also a good musician. What he meant, what, the reason he said that was Vernon Duke was one of the few musician songwriters. Because most songwriters are melodic geniuses. They know very little about harmony, 
We had to make them sound good. By we, I mean Tommy Flanagan and Hank Jones and Alice Larkins. Right, you had to find the voicings and the kind of style for it. They, yeah. they did. Yeah. Although Mancini was played pretty well. Mm -hmm. Vernon Duke played very well. He was a classical musician, you know. So that's what Mercer meant by that, which was a supreme compliment, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've had I've had a, a beautiful life that way. You mm -hmm. know? You know? Do you have any uh, aspirations? Is there someone out there right now that you haven't worked with? Maybe somebody young coming up the pike right now, or somebody you heard on the radio that you would love to work with. Well, it's, God, it's, it's they come out of the woodwork now, you know. I mean, Jazz FM, I mean, he's. You hear, uh, you hear some a uh, new great piano player almost monthly, you know, which is quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. We were like four guys in New York who were trying to play <laughs> like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Was Al Haig, Bud Powell, Joe Albany, uh, uh, I mean, we were just a few of us, just a few of us trying to do it. Now you've got. As I say, once a month you hear another great piano player. It's phenomenal, really. That's right. It's great. But we started it. <laughs> right on. We started it. Yeah. Thank you so much. My that pleasure. Was beautiful. Hey. Okay. All right. Well, that was amazing. I love Gene DeNovi. Join me next week. Ralph Ben Mergi will be my guest. He is probably my favorite interviewer in Canada many years of being a fan. Oh my God, I've known him so long. I've known him since the early days of Yuck Yucks. Uh, he sang with me once at the Cameron House. Didn't know he could sing. We did a video together called Super Elf. Uh, that is pretty funny. And of course, we worked together at Jazz FM, CBC, and we remain great friends. So I get to interview him for a change. I know he's going to try to turn the tables on me because he can't help himself. But it should be interesting. So thank you, and I hope you'll join me next week. Please tell your friends. Please uh, hit subscribe on that little button so you get notifications and come back every Friday. Share this information with Wild Joyous Abandon. Uh, it's a great big internet world out there, and I appreciate anything you could do to spread the word every Friday right here on the James B. Podcast. Thanks.